I would like to start. Uh, for those who uh, don't know me, my name is Dr. Stefan Hartson. I'm with the TARS Oceanographic Foundation. And together with JERFSA, we are putting up the lecture series now in the 18th season. And um, I always like to make a point to thank our sponsors, which is the Rotary Club, Jupiter Antiquesta, and also Jupiter Inlet District. Uh, without the help of these two organizations, we really could not do what we are doing. And uh, so we are grateful for them uh, that they support this program and have been from uh, the very beginning. And so that's all wonderful. And tonight we have a, a speaker. His name is Andrew Marsh. Um, he is a wind and solar scientist at Next Era Energy, uh, which is one of the largest companies in Palm Beach County and also one of the largest renewable energy developer in the United States. He grew up in Maryland, moved to California for graduate school, and says he's now a happy Jupiter resident. He wrote his PhD dissertation on X-ray emissions from solar flares while attending the University of Santa Cruz in California. And uh, he started to speak publicly about climate change after he was inspired by a training seminar with Climate Reality Project. And I'm sure he's gonna tell us a little bit more about this and also about his personal career path uh, how he got uh, to where he is today. And last but not least, he uh, pointed out that he volunteers with the Palm Beach chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. And I would expect him to tell us a little bit about that as well. And uh, with that introduction, Andrew, I hand it over to you and uh, please take it away. And as I said, any questions, please put into um, the chat box and we'll get to them later. All right. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you, everyone who showed up to watch me talk. I hope you all enjoy yourselves and both learn something and hopefully become inspired to take some action by the end of this as well. So this is what I will talk about. I divided the speech really up into three parts, and there's a little introductory section at the end. So I'll talk about my personal experience with climate change and some of the science behind it. I'll talk about my current position at Next Era Energy, which is really interesting and is really something that I'm passionate about. And then lastly, I'll talk about my work with Citizens Climate Lobby, who are a nonpartisan lobbying group that's advocating for strong climate policy solutions. And I'll get into more details about that as well. So this is me and my family. I'm this cute looking fellow here on the left. That's my sister, my younger brother, my parents. And this picture was taken at Kings Canyon National Park out in California. And the reason I want to start with this is because I was privileged to have parents who loved camping, loved hiking, loved the outdoors. And so I really got a strong connection to nature from a young age. And they also love to travel. So I got a really diverse experience going to different parts of the US and seeing all these fantastic sights and scenes. And I feel like that has really influenced who I am and what I work on today. As far as being a scientist, and this is obviously meet the scientist, I've <laughs> pretty much since I was pre-kindergarten had a scientific mind, a scientific lean. This is a drawing I made of an astronaut back in pre-K probably. And then in kindergarten or first grade, I had a research journal that I would make really profound notes in such as animals and plants are alike because they both need nutrients. And then I would list a abridged version of all the animals in North America. So this is something I've been really passionate about for a long time. And uh, let's see, there might be a slide missing, which is okay. So <laughs> the slide that I had put in is just a quick one. So you're not missing much. As Stefan mentioned, I did my dissertation, my graduate work on solar flares at the University of California in Santa Cruz. So 
I started off at a young age, really interested in science. I got my undergrad degrees in physics and astronomy. I went to grad school for solar astrophysics. And that's actually all I'm going to say about my dissertation for the rest of this talk, because I gained a lot of skills from it and it was a very useful experience, but the work I did is completely different now from what it was in grad school. If you want to talk about solar astrophysics and nano flares and the coronal heating problem and things like that, if you even know what those mean, then feel free to reach out to me and we can do that. But I want to start with talking about climate change because to me, this is really the defining both scientific and socio-political issue of our time right here. The International Panel on Climate Change, as many of you know, has been putting out reports for um, a decade or more, I think, at this point. And we've reached a moment in history where we have 10 years to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. That is a huge shift, a big undertaking in not that much time. And this sort of sets the framework for a lot of what I'm going to talk about, because as I said, this is an incredibly important issue. And we're going to have to make pretty drastic changes in order to prevent kind of catastrophic warming and catastrophic heating. And I'm going to make a controversial statement here as well. I'm a scientist. I love science. But I also believe that right now, at this point in time, we need activists more than scientists. The science of climate change is clear and has been clear for decades at this point. The fact that it's a huge problem that we're going to see incredible harm to the planet and to us if we keep going at the rate we are. But the policy, the government side, the you know, movers and shakers have not kept up with the science. So what we really need now is for people like you and me and everyone you know to stand up and start making noise and change that. And many of you are probably aware that the earth is heating up, that climate change is a real phenomenon, and this just shows that over a period from 1880 to the present. And this is just the surface temperature of the earth once you get to 2018 or so. The trend is it's going up. And another interesting factoid, I'm not sure if you can see this waiting room piece over my screen, hopefully not, but 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have happened since 2001. And that's just another clear fact that the earth is getting hotter. And we know why it's getting hotter. We can look at and scientists have looked at carbon dioxide greenhouse gas concentration going back hundreds of thousands of years by using ice core data. And then they can also look at surface global temperature of the earth again using ice core data and they can correlate the two over time and of course they match up really well. We expect this to be the case because we know that carbon dioxide and other gases like it are greenhouse gases. They literally trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere. So the more of a greenhouse you have, the hotter it gets. That part of the climate science is very simple, very straightforward. It's been understood for um, a long time at this point. The problem, as you might be aware, is that we have gone well above historical greenhouse gas concentration in our atmosphere, at least if you go back 800,000 years, we're way higher. And we know that the temperature is going to follow this trend. Uh, if it hasn't yet, it certainly will soon. And even worse than that, the this slide didn't load properly, but if you keep going 40 years at the current rate of increase, it goes way off the chart. You get to extremely unhealthy values that will cause really terrible warming that we would obviously like to stop before that happens. There are a lot of impacts that climate change is having, has had over the last 10, 20, 30 years, and all of these are getting worse. And 
I'm not going to go through all of these in this presentation. I'm going to focus on three that are really important to me and that I've experienced personally. One, the quote on here, the number one threat to the global economy came from the World Bank. The last four years in a row, they've said this. It's a little funny this year, funny and sad maybe because of COVID, which obviously had a very sharp, powerful short-term effect. But in the long term, climate change is and will continue to be much worse. First interesting point of climate science that's relevant to me is that floods and extreme rain are happening four times more today than they did even just in 1980. To some of you, that might seem like a long time ago. Uh, to others, perhaps not. This is my hometown, Ellicott City, Maryland, and this is the aftermath of a flood that swept through in 2016. This is what is called a one in a thousand year event. Catastrophic, tons of businesses were destroyed, had to move out of the historic area. And my parents live literally up the hill from the street. As you can imagine, this was very personal to me. Luckily, they were unharmed. Most people were okay. There was a lot of property damage, but not too many people were injured or killed by this flood. And the city began to recover. They got millions of dollars in funding from the state and from residents and started to rebuild uh, because after all, this was a one in a thousand year event and they didn't expect it to happen again two years later, but it did. And obviously this had an even more devastating effect on local businesses and shops and people who had started to come back into the city were now forced, many of them, to shut down and move out again. And this was another one in a thousand year flood event. And unfortunately, we're starting to see this all over not just the US, but all over the world. We're seeing extreme rain events, extreme flooding in the Midwest, on the West Coast, in Texas. Uh, sometimes it's triggered by tropical storms or hurricanes, like with Hurricane Harvey in Houston a couple of years ago. And we're just seeing this on a scale that we've never seen before. This is something where the, the physics, again, is pretty simple. And before you get into the detailed, complex atmospheric system, but at a basic level, warm air holds more moisture. So the warmer the air, the warmer the planet, the more moisture it can hold per unit volume. And so the bigger rainstorms, the bigger floods you can have. The interesting thing about climate change is that it does the complete opposite as well. So you get more rain, you get bigger downpours and floods, but because the air is hotter, you also evaporate that moisture really quickly. And you also get really long and really deep droughts. And I've lived through one of these when I was in California doing my graduate dissertation. So this fire, I actually saw walking to the grocery store one morning, just billowing huge plume of smoke right above, on the hills above my house that I was living in at the time. Luckily, this fire was suppressed and no damage was done to my house or any of my friends. But this last summer, the campus, the city was almost burned down by a huge complex of fires that really devastated the area. and. As you're all aware, the wildfires in California are just getting worse and worse. And a big reason for that, not just in California, but Australia and the Western US as a whole is because of these droughts that are being made worse and worse by climate change and the planet heating up. So last effect of climate change that I have personal experience with is hurricanes because now I live in Florida, obviously. And the climate change only does good things for hurricanes and bad things for us as a result. Warmer oceans lead to more intense hurricanes, as you may know. Storms, both tropical and hurricanes, 
strengthen quickly, they get their energy from warm ocean water. And the warmer the water, the more energy they can have. That also means they can intensify much more quickly. And we've seen that in the last few years. Hurricane Michael, I believe it was, the one that hit the panhandle last year, intensified far more quickly than anyone expected. I believe it was a record how quickly it got stronger. As I mentioned earlier, warmer air holds more moisture, so you can get more rain from these huge storms. The sea level is rising and continuing to go up, and of course that makes storm surge worse. We're particularly vulnerable to that here in Florida, living on or near the coast. This last point is interesting. Uh, the jet stream is you know, air currents that in a more normal climate system are fairly strong and fairly continuous. There's ebbs and flows, but climate change is making it a lot wavier and a lot less strong at certain times. So what that does is you can have cases like Hurricane Dorian, which many of you I'm sure remember, came towards here, towards Jupiter, towards West Palm Beach, and then just stopped. It stalled over the Bahamas for a solid couple days. And that storm for a lot of time was literally not moving. It was going zero miles per hour, which is very rare for a hurricane. That's not common, but it's becoming more and more common because of this weakening of the jet stream. And uh, it's just one of these effects that we're going to start seeing more and more of, unfortunately. So the question that I want to pose to all of you is, can we change? Can we stop the effects of climate change? Can we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and really create a livable world for our children, our children's children, and many generations beyond them. My personal belief is yes, that we are certainly capable of changing. And I just threw up a few examples of why humans have done incredible things. I mean, we've sent astronauts to the moon. We're planning to send them back in a few years. We built the internet which is depicted in a network traffic type diagram there in the upper right. We've made cars like Teslas, which have incredible technology and capabilities that were unthought of even 10 years ago. And then the bottom right is one of the wind turbine blades from the largest turbine in the world. And as I work in the renewable energy industry, I'm particularly fond of this turbine and think it's a really cool thing. The other good news besides just standard human ingenuity and our ability to do anything we want if we put our minds to it and focus is that the solutions to climate change already exist. And this is a great website. I would highly recommend all of you visit it. You can take a screenshot of this slide or just write it down. Drawdown.org does a site put together by the Project Drawdown. And they basically worked with, went to a bunch of experts in a bunch of different fields, multidisciplinary, and found 100 solutions to climate change, ranked them in order of how powerful each solution is. And there are some, prizes, some uh, surprises on this list. For example, I think the number fifth or Sixth solution is educating women, particularly in third world countries or developing countries. That can actually have a huge impact on climate change. So I'd all, all of you highly recommend go check out this website. 80 of these solutions are available today, right now, with no new technology development, no R&D required. They are commercialized. They exist. They are being implemented in the US and abroad. And 20 of the solutions are more future movements and developing technology research. But we have most of them, the vast majority, already here. What's lacking is the will to action. 
fortunately, that will to act is becoming easier and easier, at least in the electricity sector because of economics. I mentioned I work in renewables. This is a chart that shows the cost of energy per different type of power plant. So we have nuclear all the way on the left, then coal, then natural gas, and then all the way on the right, we have large solar farms and then large wind farms onshore. And you can see that the costs are well below some of these other sources of electricity and they're renewable. They don't emit any greenhouse gases when they're operating. They have minimal emissions that accompany the manufacture and transportation of these systems. And these costs are driving a very rapid shift towards renewable energy, both in the US and abroad. And this is a great thing for the environment. This is great for our economy. Before this year, wind technician and solar panel installer were the two fastest growing jobs in the country. I'm not sure if that's still true post COVID, but there's a huge economic and environmental opportunity in reimagining and recreating our energy system. And that's something which I'm very excited to be a part of. I'm very excited that the answer to this question of can we change is yes. And so now I'll describe what I do for my day job. And I work for NextEra Energy Resources technically, <laughs> which is uh, part of NextEra Energy. So NextEra Energy is a huge company. It's a Fortune 500 company. It owns FPL, which is the company that almost all of you or all of you get your power from, your electricity. And FPL operates entirely in Florida, as you're probably aware. But NextEra also owns NextEra Energy Resources, the part of the company that I work for which builds wind, solar, and battery projects all over the US. So not in all 50 states yet, but in perhaps 40 of them, we have projects. And uh, we're actually the largest renewable energy and battery storage developer in the United States and have been doing it for a long time. So my focus as a measurement scientist is on meteorological stations or MET stations for short. So the obvious question is why do we deploy them? And we have literally hundreds of these devices scattered around the country. And the reason that our company and other companies do this is to accurately measure and predict how much wind or how much sun is at a particular location. You want to do this ideally before you build a wind or a solar farm because there's nothing quite as accurate as on-site data. We have satellites and we have models that can get pretty close to the amount of wind or sun at a site, but their accuracy is still not the greatest and we really need measurements on the ground to make sure we're building the right projects or making good decisions on where to put these. And then also we have these stations at operating sites once they've already been built to see, are we producing as much energy as we should be? If we have enough wind blowing to produce 100 megawatts, but we're only producing 50 megawatts of energy, something's probably wrong. And so we can catch a lot of issues at wind and solar projects by using these types of measurements. So I have a couple props here. <laughs> so this is what's called an anemometer and it is used to measure wind speed. Faster the wind goes, the faster it spins and the faster your frequency signal that you get from it. And then this, you've probably all seen some type of variation of this, a lot of these look like a chicken. This is a wind vane and it's used to measure the direction of the wind. And these are the two most important instruments 
on our wind meteorological uh, meteorological stations. So these meteorological stations can be fairly complex. This is a permanent station. We also have ones that we deploy temporarily before projects get built. And you can see that they have instruments at a bunch of different heights and a bunch of different orientations coming off of the tower. On operating sites, we have lights for aircraft. So they don't run into them. And a lot of times, we need to have them wired into the ground so they don't just topple over. And these things can be uh, between 60 to 100 meters tall. Uh, so that's between 180 and 300 feet, more or less. These are large pieces of steel and measurement equipment. And this is a picture of a real one deployed out in the field. And if they need to be fixed, guess what? Someone has to climb up the outside of it and fix those instruments, take them out and swap them. So we, I haven't done that personally. I would love to have the opportunity, but we hire other vendors who specialize in that type of work. So we also have meteorological, uh, excuse me, meteorological, <laughs> struggling with that word tonight, stations on solar projects, both when they're being developed and then after they're built. These are pictures of instruments known as pyranometers. And pyranometers are essentially just devices that measure how much sun you have at a site. That's it, they have two domes so that you have a really insulated layer inside, and you get a really accurate measurement of how much sun you get. And this is an example of a full meteorological station that includes a pyranometer. So you would mount your pyranometer here, and you would have, look at that, they have an anemometer and a wind vane, just like I just showed you to measure your wind speed and direction. You would have a sensor that measures air temperature and relative humidity. Uh, temperature is really important because solar panel efficiency changes a lot with how warm or cold it is. The hotter it is, the worse your solar plant will perform. So that's an important input into our models that predict how much energy a solar plant will produce. We also like to measure how much rain or snow there is at a site. And sometimes we'll have specialized equipment, usually two solar panels next to each other that measure how much soiling you get. And soiling is just dirt or snow or anything that can cover the solar panels potentially and prevent them from getting sun. And that can obviously affect how much energy a plant produces once it's built. And here is a picture of a real live solar meteorological station. These are the soiling station measurements that I talked about. And here are the pyranometers. There's your air temperature, humidity, and your power source down here. So I, I know we're going to wait till questions for the, uh, for the end. My tendency is to take questions along the way. But um, if you have any, just post them in the chat and we'll address them later on. I also want to go back to wind for a moment. So remember when I showed you these wind meteorological towers, they are huge. They are, as I said, between you know, 180, 300 feet. So they are expensive to install and they have a big footprint. So a lot of landowners don't like to have them on their land. But there is a big movement now in the wind development industry towards remote sensing. And this is one of the ways that we can measure wind speed remotely. This device is called a SODAR for sonic detection and ranging. And what it does, I don't think the, the sound is on here, but it literally chirps. 
It chirps, sends pulses of sound up into the air. And some of those pulses will reflect back down. They'll be distorted by atmospheric uh, thermal gradients. And the shifts in those pulses when they come back can tell you which way the wind is blowing, kind of like your wind vane, and how fast it's going, kind of like your anemometer. Except, <coughs> excuse me, these things just sit on the ground and are pretty cheap and easy to install compared to a full tower. So here, oh, I do have the sound. Let's see if I get it to work. Nope, guess not. Well, <laughs> instead of that, you get this beautiful picture of a SOADAR deployed out in the field. And I've actually been out in the field and repaired several of these, I helped to install several of these. And they're, they're interesting machines for sure. Fairly complex. There's a lot of processing going on uh, compared to a Met Tower. So the other kind of pioneer in this remote sensing realm trying to replace these big, huge, bulky towers are called LIDARs. And you may have heard of them because LIDAR is a technology used in self-driving cars, for example. It's used for detailed to topographic mapping, but you can also use it to measure the wind speed. So this device shoots a laser up into the sky. And just like the SODAR, some of the laser reflects back down. And based on the Doppler shifts, the shifts in the frequencies of the laser, you can calculate how fast the wind is at a bunch of different heights and what direction it's going. And you need this information ultimately to predict if you build a wind farm and you have a turbine that's, you know, 300 feet high, 600 feet high, how much energy do you expect it to produce? How much wind is blowing at that height? So that's really the, the value of this data. And that's why it's so important for us to put these devices in the field and to make sure that they're working properly, that the data is good quality and that they're communicating. And I spend a lot of my time troubleshooting issues with equipment that is not working or not communicating the way it's supposed to. So that is my main set of responsibilities as a measurement scientist is dealing with those issues. And I was originally inspired to become a measurement scientist or at least to work in renewable energy because of essentially finding, let's call it my passion in grad school, realizing it was not my graduate work at all. <laughs> as much as I loved my advisor, I loved the team that I worked with, there are probably only 30 to 40 people in the world who cared about the work I was doing. And working in renewables to me feels a lot more impactful and a lot more meaningful and that I can really affect change in the world in a significant way. And speaking of change, I want to come back to this question of can we change and will we change? I know we can, but will we? This is where will comes into play in a different sense. Political will, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk, the science on climate change is clear, has been clear for decades. Of course, it's ever evolving and ever shifting, but I firmly believe we're at a point where we need more activists, we need more people who are not scientists, who are not experts to stand up and say, this is an important issue for our government to address, because if not, we're going to be suffering even more severe consequences than we are today for decades or perhaps centuries because certain greenhouse gases have a very long half-life in the atmosphere. So I work with an organization called Citizens Climate Lobby or CCL. And we are focused on five levers of political will. 
Number one is the lobbying Congress. And I was actually in a lobby meeting earlier today, which I'll share a little bit more about. The other one, the second one is media relations. So we write letters to local newspapers, letters to the editor, op-eds. We will meet with editorial boards sometimes. It's a key part of what we do. Grassroots outreach is just what it sounds like, working with other organizations, environmental organizations, climate related organizations, just getting out into communities and talking to people about climate change, uh, essentially like what I'm doing right now. And grass tops engagement is a, another version of that. Grass tops means more focused on business and community leaders and people who may have influence in a particular area or with a particular elected official and trying to get them engaged and speaking up about this issue. Last, of course, but certainly not least, because it's the foundation of all the rest of this is group development and organizing. So until very recently, I was the co-leader of our Palm Beaches chapter. And there are hundreds of CCL chapters in the US. There are several hundreds more abroad. And they're kind of the lifeblood of what we do. And the name Citizens Climate Lobby is appropriate because it is citizens. It's ordinary people stepping up and getting involved and taking action. And we're not professional lobbyists, but we try to do our best at it. CCL is very focused on a great climate solution. And when I say great climate solution, I mean something that will A, drive large scale change quickly, because as I mentioned right at the very beginning, we have 10 years uh, to drop our greenhouse gas emissions in half, cut them in half. And globally, at least before COVID, we were still going up. So that's a huge shift. Any climate policy that we support has to be fair and sticky. And by sticky, I mean bipartisan, because CCL does not want a policy to get enacted by Congress or by the president and then overturned just by the next administration or by the next Congress. We want something that has broad support and will stick around quite literally. Of course, the perhaps most important piece of this is that it has to be healthy for the planet and for the economy. And almost every climate solution that I'm familiar with will be good for the economy because doing nothing has really bad consequences for the economy. We are focused on what's called a carbon fee and dividend policy. Now that sounds really exciting, doesn't it? Don't fall asleep just yet because this is really clever and it's a policy that has widespread bipartisan support as well, which can be hard to find. So what this policy does, a carbon fee, obviously you want to put a price on emissions, on greenhouse gas emissions. Without a price, then companies can, or individuals or governments can emit as much as they want and that affects all of us, but they don't pay for it. There's no accountability. So what we wanna do is we wanna charge a fee at fossil fuels or other sources of emissions at their source, collect all that money. And that's where the other half of this comes into play, the dividend. So dividend policy just means return all of the revenue, all of the money collected by charging this fee to households as a dividend. So every household in the US, citizens and permanent residents would get paid out equally the money from this fee. This is important because some countries or some localities have implemented a price on carbon and not a dividend. And that makes it less politically feasible because when you add on this fee, of course, the price of certain goods or electricity is going to go up and how much it goes up depends on how big the fee is. But by returning all that revenue to people directly, then you offset those costs and 
for the majority of people, actually, you more than offset the cost. So you end up paying people more than they end up paying in extra expenses. If that sounds like a brilliant economic scheme, it is. It's in fact supported by over 3,500 US economists, every former chairman of the Federal Reserve, and 27 Nobel Prize winners in economics. That's a lot of support. And it's also supported by scientists and by scientific experts. The International Panel on Climate Change has come out and said that explicit carbon prices are a necessary condition of ambitious climate policy. They're not an option. They are necessary because they make everything else so much easier. Once you account for in some way, the environmental costs and the healthcare costs and the insurance costs and all of these things that are wrapped up in greenhouse gases, then it makes every other policy easier to implement. It drives technological innovation, research and development, and it just very quickly accelerates our transition to a no emissions future, a clean carbon-free future. The Southeast Florida Regional Climate Compact says something very similar. They support a national price on carbon emissions, especially revenue neutral and public dividend pop proposals policies, which is what CCL supports, this dividend type approach. And that was in their latest recommendation for federal legislative principles, what they want to support on the federal level. It can help to put some concrete numbers to this. So CCL supports a particular bill called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. That is a bipartisan climate bill. Currently it's in the House of Representatives, not in the Senate. We hope to get a Senate version introduced next year in the new session. So it's good for people. I mentioned this dividend in year 10 of this plan, a family of four would get paid $4,400 in a year. And low income households in particular are better off from this plan compared to higher income households. So they come out ahead more and more often. We get a healthier environment from this plan. So once you start to put a price on carbon, you start to very quickly eliminate coal from the electricity sector, which is really important. I personally and a lot of people in the industry think that coal should be gone as soon as possible. It's terrible for the environment. The reason that fish cans now come with mercury warnings and you have to watch your consumption is almost entirely because of coal plants. And even today, there's about 100, over 100,000 people who die in the US every year because of air pollution. And most of that, most of those deaths are from coal. So in the future, if we implemented this bill, we would save 300,000 lives through the year 2030, as opposed to 100,000 people dying per year. Just another reason to support a price on carbon. And importantly, because a lot of people will make the argument that climate policy is not good for the economy, it's not good for jobs, but that's simply not true. There have been very comprehensive economic studies done uh, by the Reeds Institute and others on how many jobs would be created by a plan like this. So we know that roughly 2 million jobs will be created in the first 10 years of this plan. And that's not just in the sectors you might expect. It's not just in clean energy or electric vehicles, or new technologies. It's in jobs like healthcare and the retail sector. And a lot of that is driven by this dividend that people get having more cash in hand and then going out and spending it in their communities. So this bill would create jobs in addition to creating a cleaner environment and paying people, paying families. And that's a sharp contrast to on the left, we see the current costs environmental and health impacts of fossil fuels 
$240 billion per year. And again, these are costs that are not included in their current economics, but need to be. So what do we do? How do we, Citizens Climate Lobby, try to make a difference and get this bill in particular or some kind of carbon price plus dividend plan passed? Because that's what we really want. We want this bill to pass Congress. We want the president to sign it. We want it to go into effect on the national level. We work with state and local governments too, but we focus on the national level because obviously that's where we can have the biggest impact. So we lobby members of Congress. I was in a meeting earlier today with Congressman Brian Mast, who's the Florida 18 representative. A lot of you are probably in his district. Other members of our chapter met with Louis Frankel, who is the Florida 21 representative down uh, further in the Palm Beach area. And tomorrow I'll be on a team that's meeting with staff from Rick Scott's office. So we keep busy. We stay in touch with these elected officials and we're always kind, we're always courteous. As I mentioned earlier, CCL is nonpartisan, bipartisan. We want a sticky climate policy. So we want people from every part of the political spectrum to get behind our plan. And that's what we're aiming for. My pitch to you, my proposal for you is to sign up for our monthly calling campaign. And the reason I want you to sign up for this campaign is because it's easy and it's effective. By easy, I mean, if you go to this website, you can take a screenshot or write it down, cclusa.org mcc. You can sign up in less than a minute, and then every month you'll get either a text or an email you get to choose, reminding you to call your member of Congress. And what this does, or at least what it's designed to do, is to create a steady kind of drumbeat of people calling congressional offices asking for action on climate change. You don't have to call specifically and say support this bill, you're welcome to. But there are other options in the scripts that you can talk about, or you can just talk about anything you want. And I'll tell you something, the easy part is true. Effective is also true because how many of you have ever called a member of Congress before? I'm guessing the majority of you haven't. And that's true across the country. So when people do call, they pay attention. And you won't talk to the actual representative or senator. You'll talk to someone on their staff. They're super friendly because they don't want to piss off their constituents. So you have nothing to fear by calling these offices. If you really don't want to talk to someone, you can call before 9 AM or after 5 PM. And these calls matter. I mean, New York Senator Chuck Schumer has said that if he gets as few as 10 calls on an issue, he knows he needs to pay attention to it. And perhaps do something about it. So we wanna make this as easy as possible for people who care about climate policy and want their elected officials to act on it, do something to help make that happen. So I would encourage all of you to go and sign up for this. You don't have to be a member of CCL. You don't have to agree with anything we're doing at all in order to join. Amazing. Let's see, I hear sound. Thanks, Stefan. So other actions that our chapter takes, we are currently lobbying, lobbying local government leaders. So we are working with the Jupiter Town Council and the West Palm Beach Town Council to get resolutions passed in support of the bill we like, the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act. And that's a picture of our chapter pre-COVID when we were actually meeting in person. How long ago that feels like we also write letters to local newspapers. We've gotten four published this year already. I say already, it's almost the end of the year, but it seems like not that long, to be honest. And that just gets our plan or approach, the issue of climate change in general, out into the world and for more people to see and care about. 
We will also organize events. We've had some really cool climate concerts. Again, this picture was pre-COVID and we were actually doing these big events in person. And they obviously helped to raise awareness for us, recruit new members. And at the time we were registering people to vote because the elections were coming up and we wanted as many environmental voters as possible. And of course, we speak and present publicly. We've done presentations for the West Palm Beach Green Living Series for various Toastmasters clubs in this area. I would actually love to speak at the, the Rotary Club, Stefan, that you mentioned earlier. I just haven't taken the initiative to reach out yet. And then of course, Jupiter High School, the this Meet the Scientist event. And I've also spoken to members of the Environmental Academy there. I'm nearing the end, so I just want to leave you with a few very inspirational slides. To solve climate change, we need great ideas, we need great activists and scientists, and I think we need you. I think it's a huge problem. It seems intractable uh, in large part because of the political nature of the issue at the moment, but I think it's they're starting to be much more agreement that something has to be done. This is not sustainable. We can't continue to live with these effects the way we are currently. So all of you can help. I'll leave you with this quote, the climate crisis has already been solved. We already have the facts and solutions. As I showed you earlier, go to Project Drawdown to see a hundred of them. All we have to do is wake up and change. Thank you all. I'll take those questions now. Hey, very cool. A hand of applause uh, for everybody out there before I job. before I mute you again. Uh, so do, do me, uh, everybody, please do me a favor. If you have a question, then uh, please type it into uh, the chat box and I will uh, just start it to give you a minute to type your questions in there. And I will ask Andrew um, to um, maybe talk a little bit about, you can still hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So maybe you can talk a little bit about um, dividend policy doesn't seem at least on first sight to be an incentive for the households and consumer to conserve energy uh, if they get just money for free. So how do you think um, this basic principle, if it works, um, does it have a component to incentivize uh, conservation at the end user level? That's a good question. So what it really does is it gives consumers a choice. So they have a choice of what to do with that dividend. If their electric bills are more expensive, then even if they're getting that dividend payment, some may choose to conserve energy, some may not. But what it will also do is it will incentivize companies to invest, building owners to invest in more energy efficient buildings, uh, perhaps especially at the commercial and industrial level where you're paying a lot more for energy. Because one way or another, if you're getting energy from fossil fuels, then those costs are going to be passed along to you. So I think it would really stimulate uh, more action and research in that kind of energy conservation. Okay, so that's a point maybe we can explore further at a different time. There are a couple of other questions in the chat box. If you just do me a favor and read them out loud, or I can read them out for you. If you want, uh, I'll start with one from Kylie. How exactly does flooding occur as a reaction to climate change? Good question. So flooding is a result of rain, as one might expect, but also of a sea level incursion. So for anyone who's lived in Fort Lauderdale or Miami, you know that they have what are called king tides or sunny day flooding which is just what it sounds like. The tide comes in and because they're so close to sea level, you get flooding just on a sunny day with no rain. That is getting worse and they're really struggling to 
upgrade the infrastructure there because the sea level is rising. So that's a you know uniquely coastal problem, but flooding in say for example the Midwest or you know like a city where I'm from, that's a result of more rain and larger storms which are fueled by warmer air and more moisture and climate change makes the planet's surface warmer it also makes the lower atmosphere warmer and so that is ultimately how you get more flooding from climate change very good uh, question from isabella uh, what is the cost of monitoring equipment and have you installed equipment at a site and determined it wasn't a good location for a project? So I'll answer the second question first. <laughs> the answer is yes, all the time. Uh, I think our, our hit rate for projects where we install equipment versus where we build is definitely not 100%. Um, that can be for a lot of reasons. It doesn't just have to be because there's not that much sun or wind. It's actually a hard thing to do to build a wind or a solar farm. There's a lot of pieces that need to come together. So there's the land part of it, obviously. You need landowners to be okay with putting them on their land. You need transmission a lot of the times. So you'll have to build uh, substation and transmission lines in order to connect to existing transmission so you can actually get the energy out. And there's also permitting, environmental considerations. Sometimes you have endangered species near or at a project and you might not be aware of that before you start to develop it and you find out eventually, and then you can't build it. So there are a lot of reasons why projects might fail. Another one is public opposition, quite frankly. There's, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot of opposition, depending on where you go, to having wind or solar farms installed in some places. So if people don't want them there, then they'll most likely not get built. And oh, as far oh. as the, the cost of monitoring equipment, your first question. So for uh, a wind meteorological tower, it's around uh, 25,000 to install and uh, purchase the equipment for. Similar for a solar met station. For a uh, LIDAR, that's a little bit more expensive. They're more like 50,000 uh, to for the power supply and then close to 100,000 for the LIDAR itself because uh, it's a lot of technology packed into that box. Uh, next question uh, from Tammy. Uh, are there incentives for private citizens to install solar panels? There are. There are different incentives on the federal, state, and local levels. I'm not really familiar with the incentives in Florida. I'm afraid I can't really give more information. But if you do a Google search on, for example, like tax breaks for solar, then um, that's a good search to do. You can find breakdowns by states, um, by localities. And in most places in the US, you will get paid well, first of all, if you have solar on your roof, you don't have to buy electricity from the utility. So you save money that way. And then in most places, if you overproduce, like you don't use all the energy that your solar panels are producing, then you will get paid by the utility for that extra energy. And the the lifetime over which that payoff helps you break even ranges depending on where you are in the country from a few years to I think 10 is probably the, the longer side of getting that investment back. All right, very good, Andrew. I don't see any more questions here. Um, 
kindly enough, you left some uh, um, contact information on your large last slide that we see here. Um, so everybody who is interested in the citizen climate lobby uh, activities can reach out to them and through them probably also to Andrew, I suppose, even if you're not the uh, in the leadership position anymore and you uh, step back from that. So I encourage everybody to do that and read up more about uh, solar. Andrew, thank you very much again uh, for uh, volunteering, so to speak, um, to bring your message uh, to all the students and uh, some of the other regular uh, participants of the Meet the Scientist lecture series. That is the last one uh, for 2020. We'll be back in January. Uh, we'll send out again the detailed information and the Zoom link. Uh, we'll probably continue the entire series um, uh, on Zoom uh, just to be on the safe side and hopefully then we'll, we can all get vaccinated sooner or later and we can actually meet each other again, make music together and enjoy each other's company in these kind of environments. And okay. I'm looking forward to see everybody then in person. And in the meantime, uh, I wish everybody Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and Hanukkah summer. And so hopefully everybody has a good time. Uh, stay safe, keep safe. If you have any further comments, uh, feel free to direct them to us or to Andrew uh, one way or the other. And uh, both Andrew and I, I think, will find some time to respond um, if we get any further inquiries. So Andrew, thank you very much again. Uh, for a really wonderful uh, lecture uh, on solar and alternative energy and also for your optimism uh, <laughs> with regard to the future. I'm a little older. Uh, my optimism is slowly weaning and turning into cynicism. So we need to hand it off to the next generations uh, so they can bring their optimism and tip the scale in the right direction. And so with that, I wish everybody good night. Thank you very much for tuning in and I'll see you the next time. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, it. Andrew. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.